What do you get when an American football coach becomes the manager of a British soccer team? Why you get one of the most unexpectedly beloved TV series of our time. In a world of uncertainty, Ted & Co. delivers some good old-fashioned feel-good and positive viewing. And for the next 60 minutes, we're going to be looking at all things Ted Lasso. We're starting, though, with the show's many friendship moments. Take a look. You know, I think that if you care about someone and you got a little love in your heart, there ain't nothing you can't get through together. You know what I'm saying? Welcome to Ms. Mojo. And today, we're counting down our picks for the top 10 friendship moments on Ted Lasso. You helped this panda become a lion. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> for this list, we're looking at the warmest and fuzziest displays of camaraderie from the hit sports dramedy. We'll be discussing seasons one and two, so consider this your official spoiler warning. Number 10, Leslie Higgins counsels Keely Jones. If there's something everyone should do, it's appreciate Higgins more. I'm happy to be on the list. After Keely gets an amazing career opportunity, she soon realizes that means the end of her time doing PR for AFC Richmond or working with Rebecca anymore. Unfortunately, no one she normally goes to for advice is available. Enter Leslie Higgins, who ends up comforting Keely with some off-the-cuff guidance. I don't want to appear like I'm not grateful for the amazing opportunity she's given me here. Keely, a good mentor hopes you will move on. It's a little bit bittersweet seeing Keely leave the club. After all, Rebecca offering her a job in the first place was a great building block to their bond. We were never worried that Keely and Rebecca's beautiful relationship would suffer with the change, but we weren't prepared for how hard we'd cry at this conversation between the two boss besties. A bit of advice for being a boss. Hire your best friend. Number nine, the Diamond Dogs. All right, Diamond Dogs, as canines, we are supposed to lack opposable digits, but right now I'm gonna ask you thumbs up or thumbs down. Ted Lasso consistently tackles complex topics head on, whether it's mental health or even masculinity. I must say that this is lovely. The coach's office becomes an inner sanctum for Ted, Coach Beard, Nate, and Higgins to discuss any number of issues on someone's mind. Like when Ted confides about his mixed feelings following a one night stand with Flo. Tell you what, I gotta get y'all some satin jackets made with Ted Lasso's personal dilemma squad embroidered on the back there. Uh, ooh, that's clunky. Their helpful advice births the Diamond Dogs, named after the David Bowie album. Their Dilemma Squad has become a recurring fixture of the series. The Diamond Dogs have struck again. Though the sanctity of keeping things confidential gets broken in season two, this gang gives new meaning to the term man's best friend. <laughs> Number eight, Higgins Christmas Dinner. As a gesture of goodwill on Christmas Day, AFC Richmond's director of communications, Leslie Higgins, opens up his house to the teammates who cannot return home for the holidays. Expecting a small turnout, Higgins is understandably shocked when so many of the expatriate players decide to attend. You've become quite popular, Leslie. This is by far the most people we've ever had. During the dinner, they share and feast on foods and homemade dishes from their own cultures in a sweet and lovely display of kindness. It was truly an honor to have you with us to share our traditions and help make a few new ones. <laughs> to the family we're born with and to the family we make along the way. The dinner is capped off with a surprise street performance by Rebecca and Ted, which caps off the magical Christmas celebration. The soul's coming down. Number seven, the entire club shows up for Rebecca Welton's dad's funeral. So we're all going to his funeral as a team. During one of the most heart-tugging storylines of season two, Rebecca learns that her father has passed away. In an act of empathy, the entire AFC Richmond team attends the funeral to not only pay their respects, but to also support their grieving friend. How many of them came? All of them. Another of them are wearing trainers. At the service, they continue to show their solidarity by singing along with Rebecca during her eulogy using Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. Even Roy Kent gets in on the action. It's a bittersweet scene that proves as long as you are part of the Richmond team, you are never alone. 
Number 6. Roy Kent Gives Rebecca Dating Advice After attending a double date with Keely and Roy, Rebecca feels as if she's in a good place in her love life. Oh, terrific. Who do you support? Well, I bounce back and forward between United and City, whichever club's winning, typically. However, thanks to Roy's blunt honesty, she gets a much-needed wake-up call. The retired footballer tells her straight up that her date is fine, but nothing special, and that she deserves someone who makes her feel electric. You deserve someone who makes you feel like you've been struck by f***ing lightning. Don't you dare settle for fine. It's a startling and defining moment for Rebecca that changes the trajectory of her Season 2 storyline. His advice might not have been what she wanted, but it's definitely what she needed. I need to be brave enough to let someone wonderful love me without fear of being hurt. Number 5. The Protest After booking a photo shoot for AFC's lead sponsor Dubai Air, Sam is conflicted when he learns their parent company is causing mass environmental destruction to his home in Nigeria. Ultimately, he decides that he no longer wants to support the corporation and pulls out of his ad contract. I can't be the face of one of their subsidiaries. Hell yeah. Look, Keely, I'm really sorry. I know how hard you worked for this. It's okay. Of course, you don't have to do it, Sam. We'll take care of it. He takes it a step further by covering their logo on his uniform right before a big game. In an act of solidarity, the entire team follows suit. What do you think you're doing? Retainment man. Go wear the same kit. Their statement is heard loud and clear. And soon after, the team has a new, less problematic sponsor. It's a moving moment that proves their strength in numbers. I just hope the rest of the team is not upset with me. Hey, doing the right thing is never the wrong thing. <laughs> Number 4. Ted Lasso Forgives Rebecca What started off as a means of sabotage blossomed into a genuine friendship. So when Rebecca has to fess up to her scheming, the stakes are high. I mean, what would be the point of telling Ted now? It doesn't change anything. It will change how I feel about you. As an act of revenge against her ex-husband, the owner of Richmond hired Ted to coach the football, or soccer team if you prefer, with the hope that he would fail. Well, the plan backfired, and the team got stronger. More importantly, she and Ted formed a bond. All you good people just trying to make a difference. Ted, I'm so sorry. Having to own up to her evil plan, Rebecca spills the tea and asks for his forgiveness, which she also has to do with Higgins after he leaves his job. I wanted to apologize to you for treating you so poorly and forcing you to be an accomplice in my moronically childish scheme. I am truly sorry, Higgins. It wasn't much of a surprise that the tender-hearted Ted would forgive and forget, but it's still sweet nonetheless. I forgive you. What? Why? Divorce is hard. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're the one leaving or if you're the one who got left. Number three, the charity ball. Displays of women supporting women are a crucial part of storytelling. And the friendship between Keely and Rebecca is one of the best examples of this in recent memory. It made me think of you. It's strong and a bit prickly. Mm. You know, I've decided to not be scared of you anymore. I didn't know you were. Before Rebecca and Keely really know each other, the former is riddled by nerves when she arrives on the red carpet at her charity gala. Taking note of this, Keely gives her some pointers on how to pose and even cheers her on from the sidelines. Just put one foot in front of the other, yeah? And if you put your hand on your hip, I make like a claw shape. It's the most fat. This helps her to break through the walls Rebecca's put up a little bit, and later champions Keely to think more of herself in her relationship. Simple, rich, fit. What about accountable? What do you mean? Well, I mean, everyone makes mistakes, but I was married to a man for 12 years who never once took responsibility for any single one of them. The night is capped off with a rickshaw ride that we definitely would have liked an invite to. Their friendship continues to shine from this point on. I love you. I love you too. Number two, Roy and Jamie Tart's hug. Here's something we never thought we'd see happen. Over the course of two seasons, arch rivals Jamie Tart and Roy Kent's hatred for one another grew stronger and stronger with every episode. 
Just when it seemed that the two would never see eye to eye, this sweet and tender moment changed their feud for good. After Jamie's father berates his son, the embarrassed footballer knocks him out. Twaddling about with a bunch of amateurs! No offence, no offence! <laughs> huh? Don't turn your back on me, you pussy! Oh! Oh! Ah! Seeing the pain the situation has caused his former teammate, Roy walks over and gives him a warm hug. Watch out now. Take it's a surprising and touching breakthrough, and hopefully the first of many that the two frenemies will share. Number one, the panic attack. Ted, it's okay. It's okay. Try to breathe. I can't, I can't, I can't, I don't know what's going on. In one of the most talked about scenes of season one, a night on the town takes a serious turn. While watching Rebecca perform karaoke, Ted begins to suddenly feel a wave of anxiety come over him. Displaying symptoms of dizziness, shortness of breath, and a racing heart, it becomes clear that he's experiencing a panic attack. Rebecca eventually finds him and walks him through it by offering him empathy and comfort. I'm going crazy. <laughs> no more than anyone else. The show received lots of praise for its realistic and authentic portrayal. It's a standout moment that sticks in the minds of fans even into season two and cements Rebecca and Ted's bond. Oh, it was nothing, Ted. No, no, it was something. You got a coupon for life, young lady. Yeah, I got your back. Think of me as your own personal metaphorical St. Bernard. Okay, while I've mentioned the show's positivity and feel-good nature, it's also important to note that the series has no problem tackling serious issues. Here's what I'm talking about. I'm going crazy. No more than anyone else. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 times Ted Lasso tackled serious issues. Yeah, tissues over there, huh? Hmm. Yes, tissues. For this list, we're looking at all of the most poignant times this upbeat show addressed heavy topics. Because important plot points will be discussed, a spoiler alert is now in effect. Which of these moments resonated with you the most? Number 10, Roy Copes with Retirement. Hold on, can you believe it? It's Kent! The first part of Ted Lasso sees Roy Kent showing us his amazing soccer skills as AFC Richmond's captain and veteran, but ultimately an injury forces him to retire. Understandably, he's a bit lost as what to do next. Because today, you will play like a bunch of little pricks! You hear me? He starts off coaching his niece's football team and then reluctantly takes a gig as a broadcaster. But it's clear to everyone around him that he's struggling and unhappy. We're just on the outside, looking in, judging them. In the end, Roy accepts that he's no longer a player and joins Richmond's coaching team. His story is proof that even unexpected life twists like early retirement can lead to truly wonderful things. Hello, coach. Really glad you decided. Shut up. Just shut up. We were so happy seeing him sprint across the city back to his old football club. Number nine, Ted deals with his marriage ending. Shell, there's something I could do or something I could say that would make you be happy. Just being with me, I'd do it. When Ted's wife and son come to visit, we see that things are rocky between the married couple. By the end of the trip, they part ways for good. You don't have to keep trying anymore. It's okay. Ted's true feelings about the split surface later when the team goes to an away game. He gets drunk and emotional in his hotel room while struggling to sign the divorce papers. It's a rare instance where we see him become less than kind while working through the troublesome feelings that come with ending a marriage. What the hell are you doing? I'm, I'm so sorry, I just... I... You're what? What is this? Which is just my thoughts on the team. Of course, this isn't the only breakup the show depicts. Rebecca's divorce is the reason Ted became the coach after all. Though the characters handle separations in different ways, their experiences speak to a pain that many can relate to. In the end, it's just about being with the right person, isn't it? Of course. Number eight, the characters face career changes. 
While Roy was essentially forced to retire, many other characters deal with changing career trajectories. Ted and Coach Beard are obvious examples, as they had never helmed an English football team before. Feels different, Coach. I mean, the same, but different. We also see Nate get promoted to a coaching position, but the new job leads to drastic behavioral changes nobody saw coming. Hey, dog, you haven't been fired. It's worse. You've been promoted. Keely, on the other hand, swerves into PR, even starting her own firm at the end of the second season. While it's undoubtedly exciting, she has to find a new work-life balance, the implications of which have only just started to be explored. You helped this panda become a lion. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> There's no doubt that promotions and career shifts have their perks, but we can always trust Ted Lasso to paint an honest picture of the pitfalls, too. You are going to take a well-earned holiday. Number 7. Rebecca's Father Dies we don't know much about Rebecca's relationship with her father until his sudden passing, which shines a light on grief in ways we don't often see. This episode features a heart-wrenching moment where she reveals that she witnessed her dad cheating on her mother. It's why I've always hated him. And I still hate him. Naturally, she struggled to forgive him as a result and must now face her feelings. It all culminates in her eulogy, where she sings Never Gonna Give You Up. Never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down. As her emotions take over, she's touchingly lifted up by Ted and all her other loved ones. Never gonna give, never gonna give. Kiss you up. Death can trigger complex reactions, and Rebecca's process is a perfect example of that. Number six, Sam takes a stand against the team sponsor. Sam Obasanya has quickly become a fan favorite character, and for good reason. I'd like to pull out of my campaign with Dubai Air. He's actually the one who tackles one of the most significant and large scale issues in the show. When he learns that Richmond's sponsor, Dubai Air, is owned by a company that's polluting the water in his native Nigeria, he's faced with a choice. It's come to my attention that Dubai Air's parent company, Cerithium Oil, is destroying Nigeria's environment and at the same time bribing government officials to look the other way. After all, he was in the process of doing an ad campaign for them. He takes a stand by covering up the sponsor's name on his jersey before stepping onto the pitch, and everyone has his back. The storyline provides a deep look into the corporate side of sports, and Sam's choice to stick to his convictions powerfully proves that we should always fight for what's right. I'm not here to talk about football. I'm here to ask the Nigerian government to put an end to decades of environmental destruction caused by cerithium oil. Number five, Rupert tries to put Rebecca down. Oh, it's Rupert, Ted. Especially for the man who's managing my club. Used to be your club. Rebecca was the boss that we loved to hate at the beginning of the series, as we watched her try to sabotage Ted. But after learning more and more about her ex-husband Rupert, we came to understand why she wanted to ruin his football club. I must say, I love that dress. Oh, it's very youthful. Even after their divorce, we see him go out of his way to embarrass and belittle her. He actually has a baby with his new partner, despite having told Rebecca that he didn't want children. People change. I do want a child. I suppose I, I didn't want one with... before. Luckily, she has friends like Ted and Sassy who aren't afraid to knock him down a peg when he's out of line, which is often. Oh, I forgot I had these on me. Oh, wait a second. I forgot I'm left-handed. More importantly, she gradually realizes that she and so many other women in similar situations deserve way better. I'm gonna wear red to your funeral. I will be a beacon of joy to the other three people there. Number four, the team employs a sports psychologist. Sports psychologist Dr. Sharon was a welcome new addition to the show when she helped Danny cope with accidentally killing the team's mascot. The Yips are not a superstition. They are a mental condition, one that can be fixed with discipline, not denial. When he gets the yips and is unable to play, she helps him through it. Soon, virtually every Richmond player books a session with her. Thank you, Sharon. For real. You're welcome. She's amazing. Ted is pretty skeptical about the new doc at first, but he eventually sees how valuable her contributions are. It's safe to say that mental health in general is often overlooked, and the problem looms large in men's sports. Maybe I don't want to learn the truth. Ted, the truth will set you free. 
But first, it'll piss you off. Many athletes think they're supposed to be tough and don't realize they don't have to face the hard times alone. Dr. Sharon is proof of that, and the whole team benefits from her presence. Thanks to you, I've learned that expressing my vulnerabilities can help my patients with this. Number three, Jamie's father mistreats him. Jamie Tart is introduced as the cocky rookie on the team who butts heads with his new coach and captain on a daily basis. Never say a bad word about me, old club. Even though I did carry him through every match, but they're good lads. When he joins Manchester City, Ted is close to giving up on him. But then, the coach sees Jamie's dad berating him after a game and realizes that his attitude is a result of his father's mistreatment. After the player rejoins Richmond, his dad drunkenly confronts him in front of his teammates. Well, you know, can I go? Little moody bitch, just because you got your ass served to you, I'm a player. <laughs> Don't speak to me. So Jamie ends up punching him and leans on former rival Roy Kent for support. Who wouldn't sympathize with him here? It just goes to show that we never really know what's going on with someone and that there's often a reason for bad behavior. Number two, Ted talks about his father's death. Ted is usually the wildly optimistic guy who doesn't seem to let anything get him down. He was a good dad. I don't think he knew that. But Dr. Sharon knows there's more going on with him. After having told her that his father took his own life a few episodes prior, Ted finally reveals what happened all those years ago. We learn that he heard it unfold and was the one who found his dad's body. I opened up the door and there he was. As a result, he's been angry with him ever since. This episode is significant for a number of reasons. And Sassy didn't say anything for the first time in her life, and I just screamed, choked, cried. He came running after me in his dressing gown, begging me to stop, but I just ran upstairs and called 911. For one thing, it finally helps us understand who Ted is. But more than that, it brings issues of unresolved grief and trauma to the fore and tackles them with the grace and complexity they demand. I think he would have known how good he was and stuff he didn't really care about being good at. He, I don't think he would have done it. Number one, Ted's mental health struggles. As we mentioned, Ted Lasso doesn't shy away from talking about mental health struggles among a number of its characters. And we get to see the titular protagonist go through many ups and downs. Notably, Ted has a panic attack when he's out at a karaoke bar with the team, and Rebecca helps him through it. Ted, it's okay. It's okay. Try to breathe. I can't, I can't. I can't. I don't know what's going on. We see him have another episode during a game where he runs off the field and basically disappears. Are you okay? I want to make an appointment. Dr. Sharon finds him in her office, where he finally confesses to needing help. The show's willingness to spotlight Ted's struggles and the treatment he receives with honesty, nuance, and care is crucial. Through these storylines, it destigmatizes talking about mental health and normalizes asking for help. I'm really sorry about that, you know, getting all worked up and saying stuff like that, then storming out of here. It happens. You can usually measure a show's success based on the amount of quotes us regular people bring about in our everyday lives. Things like, uh, how you doing? Or, uh, don't! Or what about yada yada yada? I think you also get the point, and you probably know where I'm going with this. And you're right, Ted Lasso has quotes for days. Here they come. So let's get away from the bad mojo coming off that penalty box and, you know, have some fun. Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome to Ms. Mojo. Today, we're counting down our picks for the top 10 Ted Lasso quotes on Ted Lasso. Feels different, coach. I mean, the same, but different. For this list, we're looking at the most heartwarming and inspirational quotes spoken by everyone's favorite mustachioed football coach. Since we are discussing plot details to give context to these quotes, a spoiler alert is necessary. So, what other Ted Lasso quotes make your heart feel like a palace of crystals? Number 10. Success is not about the wins and losses. 
It's established early on how selfless Ted Lasso is, and this is one quality that helps him win people over. You know what you do with tough cookies, don't you? Nah. Dip them in milk. <laughs> Not long into Ted's tenure as the Richmond coach, Trent Krim, the tough-as-nails reporter for The Independent, is commissioned to write an up-close and personal profile on him. Do you feel it sends the right message, having a party after a loss? Well, Trent, I've never really concerned myself too much with wins and losses. The two have an eventful day, culminating in a super spicy supper at an Indian restaurant. Krim thinks it's irresponsible of Ted to coach a sport he knows nothing about, but Ted assures him, in between fire breaths, that success means something different to him. Me? I love coaching. Now, I'm gonna say this again, just so you didn't think it was a mistake the first time I said it. For me, success is not about the wins and losses. It's about helping these young fellas be the best versions of themselves on and off the field. It's a moment that changes Krim's perception of Ted and assures us, the audience, that the first step in achieving our goals is being our truest selves. And it ain't always easy, Trent, but neither is growing up without someone believing in you. Number nine, they need to believe in themselves. I do love a locker room. It smells like potential. One of the major themes of the show is the power of belief, whether that be in oneself or in the collective strength of a team. It is so central to Ted Lasso that it literally hangs over the door of his office. When team owner Rebecca gives Ted a tour of the club, she shows him an old picture of the stadium, adding that people claim to still see ghosts from that era. Yeah, some of the locals claim they still see fallen soldiers wandering around the pitch. Ooh, that's spooky. Oh, do you believe in ghosts, Ted? Mm, I do. But more importantly, I think they need to believe in themselves. Yeah. Ted's response proves that a belief in one's own potential is far more important than anyone else's validation. This he later points out to Nate when he's insecure about the strategy he suggests. Tricky time hearing folks that don't believe in themselves, so I'm going to ask you real quick again. Do you think this idea will work? Yeah, I do. Whoa! Why are you screaming at us? And even though that belief may be crooked, all that matters is that it exists. Number eight, rom communism. I'm sorry, Roy, but I came here tonight because when you realize you want to spend the rest of your life coaching with somebody, you want the rest of your life to begin ASAP. Well into the second season of the show, the Richmond team is still struggling, mostly due to a lack of effective leadership. Ted makes the team re-watch their recent loss, hoping that they'll be able to learn from their mistakes, but this only results in them pointing fingers at each other. Never the speechmaker, Ted informs the team of his new worldview. If all those attractive people with their amazing apartments and interesting jobs, usually in some creative field, can go through some lighthearted struggles and still end up happy, then so can we. It's a beautiful reminder to always stay positive even in difficult times, because more often than not, things tend to fall just in the right place. Gentlemen, believing in rom-communism is all about believing that everything's going to work out in the end. Your rom-com may have a slightly different ending than you imagined, but just like my best friend's wedding, sometimes it's for the best. Hello, coach. I'm really glad you decided. Shut up. Just shut up. Number seven, the wisdom of age. Easy, easy, easy now. Coach, tell these boys what the first rule of my fight club is. No fight club! No fight club. One of the most prominent conflicts on the show is one that's as old as time itself. The conflict between the young, super striker Jamie Tart, and old, midfielder, later turned assistant coach Roy Kent. During the charity auction, Ted puts both players at the same table in a bid to mend their fences. Well, hey, you don't need to be best friends to be great teammates. Think about Shaq and Kobe, right? Lennon and McCartney. Heck, even Woody and Buzz got under each other's plastic. This initially doesn't go well, until Ted points out to Roy that he was once young and arrogant just like Jamie. You know how they say that youth is wasted on the young? Well, I said don't let the wisdom of age be wasted on you. All he does is plant a seed of mentorship in Roy's head and watches it germinate. We're all a lot more similar than we think, even with people we do not like. And while we may not agree on everything, we can at least be respectful of each other. I just came up with that. Number six, taking on a challenge. On the surface, the premise of Ted Lasso is simple. A fish out of water coach travels across the world to take on a job he has zero knowledge and experience for. Classic comedy trope. But it's also much more complex than that, and nothing more perfectly encapsulates that complexity than this. Are we nuts for doing this? Yeah, this is nuts. Hey, but taking on a challenge is a lot like riding a horse, isn't it? While on the plane with Coach Beard as they head overseas, Ted notes that stepping out of one's comfort zone can be quite scary. 
littered with enough stress and anxiety to fill two internets. How about I go ahead and address the larger than average elephant in the room? No, I have never coached the sport that you folks call football. At any level? Jesus. Um, <laughs> And heck, you could fill two internets with what I don't know about football. But sometimes, a little stress is what we need to perform at our very best. Ted lets his vulnerability shine through every step of the way in his new job, and is a great example to emulate because only when we're vulnerable are we able to find our true voice. Going out to the pitch, yep. the grass here, to watch practice. Training. They call practice training. Oh, it's vernacular. It won't be tough. You know what? I'm going to get it, though, because uh, training makes perfect. There you go. Number five, things that make you cry. Season two starts on a pretty tragic note. Danny Rojas takes a penalty kick during a game and accidentally hits the Richmond mascot Earl, sending it to dog heaven. At a press conference afterwards, Trent Grimm, the independent, asks Ted about the unfortunate incident. Well, when I was three years old, I got attacked by our neighbor's dog. I don't remember it happening, but my mother said it was pretty, pretty scary. Rather than pull out a clever response from his bank of eternally optimistic responses, Ted proceeds to tell a moving story. Then in high school, our neighbor, Mr. Grady, well, his, his wife passed away. And he was real sad about that, as you can imagine. And he just kind of stopped taking care of their dog. Same one that bit me. About being terrified of dogs after getting attacked by a neighbor's, but later loving and caring for that same dog before sadly having to put it down. It's funny to think about the things in your life that can make you cry just knowing that they existed it can then become the same thing that make you cry knowing that they're now gone. Dealing with the loss of a loved one is always traumatic, but Ted acknowledges that their presence in our lives certainly helps us grow. I think those things come into our lives to help us get from one place to a better one. Number four, being alone and being sad. And I want you to be grateful that you're going through this sad moment with all these other folks. The first season of Ted Lasso takes the Richmond team on a roller coaster of events, capping off with a last minute pass by former teammate Jamie Tart and rival club Manchester City in their final game of the season. Naturally, the team is crushed. The faces of the devastated players and fans likely mirror those of the audience. We may not have won, but y'all definitely succeeded. Ted walks into the downtrodden locker room and reminds the players how important it is that they have each other to lean on in this collective moment of sadness. Because I promise you, there is something worse out there than being sad, and that is being alone and being sad. It's a powerful message about teamwork and recognizing that a team should function as such in times of celebration and in times of loss. Number three, be curious, not judgmental. In what is arguably one of the best scenes of the entire show, Ted agrees to a game of darts with Rupert, proposing that if Rupert loses, he will forfeit his seat in the owner's box. Rupert takes him up on this, oblivious of how seasoned a dart player Ted is. Oh, wait a second. I forgot I'm left-handed. <gasps> oh, I was gonna be a hoot. Although initially losing, Ted recounts this rather impressive story about a Walt Whitman quote he once saw painted on a wall. You know, Rupert, guys have underestimated me my entire life. And for years, I never understood why. It used to really bother me. But then one day, I was driving my little boy to school, and I saw this quote by Walt Whitman. It was painted on the wall there. It said, be curious, not judgmental. I like that. This made him realize that the guys who underestimated him made wrong assumptions instead of actually getting to know him. Because if they were curious, they would ask questions. You know? Questions like, have you played a lot of darts, Ted? <laughs> to which I would have answered, yes, sir. He then hits a bullseye and wins the game. Curiosity may kill the cat, but the satisfaction of knowledge will always bring it back. Number two, change can be scary. Fellas, we're broken. We need to change. And look, I know change can be scary. One minute, you're playing freeze tag out there at recess with all your buddies. Next thing you know, you're getting zits, your voice gets low. The fifth episode of season one sees Ted having to make two difficult but important decisions about his career and his marriage. On the pitch, Jamie remains as arrogant and self-centered as ever, to the detriment of his teammates. 
This leads Ted to make a highly controversial decision to substitute him right before halftime, even after scoring both goals for the team. In the locker room, Ted highlights to his players how important it is to embrace change in order to make progress. Most of the time, change is a good thing. I think that's what it's all about. Embracing change. Being brave. His decision pays off as Richmond wins the match without Jamie. Ted also realizes he needs to embrace the change in his marriage and eventually makes the painful yet admirable decision to let Michelle go. I promised myself I would never quit anything in my life. But you're not quitting, Ted. You're just letting me go. Number one, be a goldfish. One of the surprising stars on Ted Lasso is the young right back from Nigeria, Sam Obasanya. I heard my name. The player from the Nigerian Football League has trouble fitting in with his new teammates, a newcomer in a foreign land much like Ted himself. Well, we know you haven't been home in a while, so we thought we'd bring some home to you. How are you guys, man? Is she? Is she gone? After getting shown up by Jamie during a training session, Ted awkwardly tells Sam not to let mistakes weigh him down and to let them all go, just like a goldfish. You know what the happiest animal on earth is? It's a goldfish. You know why? No. It's got a 10 second memory. Be a goldfish, Sam. Once Sam is able to do this, he fits right in with the rest of the team, eventually rising to become one of the top scorers and a pretty influential player, gaining his team's support on his Dubai air protest. Ted even calls back to his goldfish advice in the first season finale after the team's devastating loss. Let's be sad now. Let's be sad together and then we can be a gosh darn goldfish. Onward, forward. All right, well, I think it's only fair that we end things with the most heartwarming moments from the show. How could we not? So yes, prepare to have all the warm and fuzzies coming your way right now. knock a doodle do. Ah, oh, good morning, Coach Lasso. Welcome to Ms. Mojo. And today, we're counting down our picks for the top 10 heartwarming Ted Lasso moments. I, I, I'll say this, though. I really enjoy getting to spend this time with you, Trent. For this list, we're looking at moments from this Apple TV Plus comedy series that showed us there just might be hope for humanity. Since there will be spoilers, we strongly recommend you go watch the show if you haven't already. Which Ted Lasso moment brought out your inner goldfish? Number 10. Biscuits with the boss. I brought you a little something. Oh, yeah, cookies. <laughs> or as y'all call them here, biscuits, right? One of the show's funniest running gags is also among the most heartwarming. Ted attempts to start a tradition in the sophomore episode by bringing Rebecca a box of cookies, or biscuits as you will fondly come to call them. Rebecca is hesitant at first, but she has a hard time resisting the delicious looking treats. Where did you get these? I'm glad you like them. You know what? I'll start bringing these to you every morning. Call Biscuits with the Boss. Something similar can be said about Rebecca's relationship with Ted throughout the first season. While it will take more than some biscuits to win Rebecca over, this is just one of many kind gestures that go a long way. You're going to show up tomorrow with biscuits, aren't you? Oh, come on now. I would not bet on that. <laughs> I mean, unless you want to win a buttload of money. <laughs> High five, tree. Woo! It's only made sweeter knowing that Ted made the shortbread confections himself packing each pink box with care, much like his biscuits. You just want to eat Ted up after seeing this. Number nine, Nate's promotion. Who the hell are you? Oh, hi, hello, I'm, uh, I'm Will. I'm the new clubhouse attendant. No, you're not, I'm the clubhouse attendant. The season one finale ultimately brings more defeat than triumph for the team. At least Nathan walks away with a win, however. Seeing that somebody else has fulfilled his duties as Kitman before the climactic game, Nate fears the worst. You shrew, you did this, didn't you? Why so hostile, Nathan? Right, I'll tell you why. You know my name. Well, I had to spell it correctly for your contract. Nate is prepared to tell Rebecca off until Ted clarifies that it's the opposite of what he thinks. He's been promoted to assistant coach. Hey, dog, you haven't been fired. It's worse. You've been promoted. In surprise party fashion, the team rushes into the room, commencing a celebration worthy of Nate the Great. Ted and Coach Beard commemorate the moment by giving Nate his own whistle, although he probably should have picked another time to blow it. By the power vested in me by the Associated Football Club of Richmond, I now pronounce you Coach Nate. 
For any hard worker who's ever felt undervalued, moments like this show that passion can pay off. Number eight, Roy's injury. What's the matter? He's not getting up. Now this looks serious. Season one sees Roy can't come to terms with getting older and accepting his feelings for Keeley. His character arc reaches a tragic yet touching turning point during the big game after suffering what looks like a career-ending injury. Roy leaves the field without the use of a stretcher as the crowd cheers him on. As Ken comes off, he claps the fans in gratitude. Once he's alone in the locker room, the hot-headed Roy lets his defenses down. Roy doesn't want anyone to see this side of him, including Keeley. Got that back here during the game. I told you, you have to get out. When she enters the room and wraps her arm around him, though, Keeley makes it clear that she's not going anywhere. Roy finally lets Keeley in, finding that perhaps there can be more to his life than just football. Number seven, Nate roasts the team. I can't say this to you. But I need to hear it. I agree. That's why you're going to do it. Nate has always felt invisible at work. But Ted comes to see his potential for greatness. When Nate wrote down his suggestions on how to improve the team, he wasn't prepared to share them in front of everybody. Had he known, Nate might have filtered some of his thoughts. Um, Sam. Oh, no. You're constantly getting beat on the wings. It's because you're indecisive. You second guess more than a shitty psychic. We're glad Ted put him on the spot, though, as it leads to one of the show's funniest and most oddly inspiring moments. The pre-game talk immediately turns into a roast, although humor often makes the truth easier to digest. Uh, Rojas. Ooh. Roast me, amigo. Right, you say that football is life, right? Football is life. Yeah, well, then your defense is death. Oh. Nate's words ignite the team's spirit and Roy's anger, but in a positive way. Most of all, it gives Nate the confidence boost he sorely needed. But your speed and your smarts were never what made you who you are. It's your anger. That's your superpower. Sometimes, motivation comes from the most unlikely places. Number six, the lasso way. You know what you do with tough cookies, don't you? No. Dip them in milk. From the moment he arrives in the UK, virtually everyone doubts Ted's ability to coach the team. Reporter Trent Krim is one of the toughest eggs to crack. Spending the day with Ted, Krim finds the coach's methods unconventional yet intriguing. Now, I'm going to say this again, just so you didn't think it was a mistake the first time I said it. For me, success is not about the wins and losses. It's about helping these young fellas be the best versions of themselves on and off the field. In the end, Krim isn't entirely convinced that Ted will lead his team to victory. However, he's ready to root for Ted every step of the way. And yes, he's in over his head. He insisted twice that he didn't care if Richmond won or lost. But if the lasso way is wrong, it's hard to imagine being right. Krim can see that Ted throws his heart into the game and pretty much every other facet of his life. That doesn't always lead to success, but Krim recognizes that it should count for something. If even a cynical journalist can succumb to Ted's charms, maybe everyone else can learn to appreciate the Lasso way, Rebecca included. And though I believe that Ted Lasso will fail here and Richmond will suffer the embarrassment of relegation, I won't gloat when it happens because I can't help but root for him. Number five, the story of Hank. In a moment that mixes tragedy with dark comedy, Danny accidentally sends the Richmond mascot to doggy heaven. While everyone is shaken by Earl's death, the coach manages to deliver some of that signature lasso comfort. Well, when I was three years old, I got attacked by our neighbor's dog. I don't remember it happening, but my mother said it was pretty, pretty scary. At a press conference, Ted reflects on a childhood incident that ignited his fear of dogs. Years later, the dog who attacked Ted loses one of his owners and is left neglected. And so I started looking after him, you know, feeding him, taking him on walks, playing fetch, all that fun stuff. Eventually, Mr. Grady's son moved his dad into a nursing home and he asked if I wanted to keep Hank. And I was like, yeah, heck yeah. And then a year or so after that, we had to put Hank to sleep. The aging dog thus becomes a member of Ted's family, although he's put to sleep after a year. Ted goes on to discuss how sometimes the most unlikely things help you grow as a person. For Ted, it was Hank the dog. I think those things come into our lives to help us get from one place to a better one. And I hope we help Earl do just that. For Richmond, Ted has helped the team get to a better place, and vice versa. Number four. Ted, let's go. While Ted Lasso is about perseverance, it's also about learning to live with your failures. Every day, 
I wake up hoping that I'll feel the way I felt in the beginning. But, but maybe that's just what marriage is, right? Losing a game is one thing, but letting go of a spouse is another. Being an eternal optimist, Ted has a difficult time accepting that his marriage is hanging on by a thread. While Ted and Michelle still work as a loving parental unit, they no longer work as romantic partners. Michelle, there's something I could do or something I could say that would make you be happy. Just being with me, I'd do it. Seeing the pain that Michelle is concealing, Ted comes to terms with what he has to do. It's bittersweet watching Ted let Michelle go, but ultimately heartwarming knowing that both are going to be in better places. You don't have to keep trying anymore. It's okay. Separation is never easy. Although, having a close friend to share a beer with can help soften the blow. Number three, Ted's panic attack. Just because somebody beams with positivity does not mean that they're not combating sadness on the inside. The stress of signing his divorce papers gets to Ted at a karaoke bar where he suffers a panic attack. After Rebecca sheds her icy exterior with a performance of Let It Go, she comes to Ted's aid. Ted. It's okay. It's okay. The tables are turned, with Ted feeling lost and Rebecca emerging as a guiding light. Rebecca can relate to what Ted is going through, as she is still not over her failed marriage. I'm going crazy. <laughs> no more than anyone else. Although Rebecca once saw Ted merely as a means to exact revenge against her ex-husband, she's come to see him as a true friend. It's tear-jerking seeing Ted break down, but so uplifting watching Rebecca's heart grow. Number two, sad together. Hey, y'all played a heck of a game out there. We may not have won, but y'all definitely succeeded. Victory appears to be in Richmond's grasp until Jamie makes an extra pass that secures the win for Manchester City. It's encouraging knowing that Ted's team spirit rubbed off on Jamie, although it comes at Richmond's expense. The team may have lost, but Ted isn't at a loss for words. Let's be sad now, let's be sad together, and then we can be a gosh darn goldfish. Ted tells the team that it's better to be sad with your loved ones than to be sad and alone. And I want you to be grateful that you're going through this sad moment with all these other folks. Because I promise you, there is something worse out there than being sad, and that is being alone and being sad. Being such a good sport, Ted also congratulates Jamie in a letter after his father scorned him for passing. While Ted is willing to resign after this failure, Rebecca gives him the motivation to stay and make the ultimate comeback next season. You listen to me, Coach Lasso. You are not going anywhere because we have work to do. Next season. Win or lose, at least Richmond will go through it together. Number one, Ted forgives Rebecca. I have something I need to tell you. Mm, deja vu. Overcome with guilt, Rebecca finally tells Ted why she hired him. In another show, it would take at least an episode for the characters to reconcile after such a bombshell. Ted, I lied to you. I hired you because I wanted this team to lose. I wanted you to fail. And I sabotaged you every chance I've had. Ted forgives Rebecca on the spot, however. As surprised as Rebecca is, this moment isn't out of character for Ted. I forgive you. You what? Why? Divorce is hard. And it doesn't matter if you're the one leaving or if you're the one who got left. It makes folks do crazy things. While Ted is visibly saddened, he knows that Rebecca's apology is genuine. Some recognize Rebecca as a villain, but Ted sees that she's just a person going through a hard time. Now that she's owning up to her mistakes, Ted has no reason to hold a grudge. Yeah, but you and me, we're okay. Come on, just shake this hand. My arm's starting to get... Ted and Rebecca have changed each other in unexpected ways. Ted is grateful for that, and Rebecca can no longer deny how much she values his friendship. You know, I think that if you care about someone and you got a little love, 
in your heart. There ain't nothing you can't get through together. You know what I'm saying? All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed this very special look at all things Ted Lasso. I, for one, can't wait to see what the show has in store for us next. I've been Matt from Watch Mojo, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.